Are some animal species more worthy of being saved from extinction? Today we explore the state of wildlife conservation following the death of the so-called most eligible bachelor in the world, Sudan the rhino. I'm Malika Bilal and you're now in the stream live on Al Jazeera and YouTube. Send us your comments and I'll try my best to get as many of them into the show. Sudan, the world's last male northern white rhino, died from old age on Tuesday, reigniting debate about the best way to preserve endangered wildlife species around the globe. Al Jazeera correspondent Catherine Soy reports. Veterinarians at the Old Pejeta Conservancy in central Kenya put Sudan to sleep because he was in too much pain and could not walk. He had been struggling for years with age complications that got worse in the last few months. But he lived a rich and illustrious life, managing to stay clear of poachers who almost wiped out the entire population of northern white rhinos in the 1970s. As Sudan got older, he became weak and his sperm count was low. So now researchers are working on ways to use in vitro fertilization to save the species from extinction. This will be the first of its kind, a delicate, expensive and risky process. We want to do everything that is possible. We even tried to keep them next to the uh, southern uh, uh, white rhinos to see whether uh, you know, we could get uh, Sudan to be a little interested. Uh, so we brought in new girls and we said, please, you know, uh, can you talk to them? And they are quite pleased and they're nice, but he just didn't respond. Sudan was 45 years old, the equivalent of about 90 human years. So what's the significance of Sudan's death and how might it influence how we attempt to save other endangered species? Well, joining me on set to discuss, Jamil Mandima is the Director of Program Design and Partner Relations for the African Wildlife Foundation. Welcome, Jamil, to the stream. So I pulled up here on my laptop because I, I, I said this term a little earlier and I want to give our viewers a glimpse at where it's from. The world's most eligible, eligible bachelor and uh, this is part of a Tinder campaign, that's the online dating app, um, to raise awareness and at one point to raise funding for Sudan, who is now passed. What is it that has inspired uh, things like this, campaigns like this, and tweets like this? Zingaya says, the news was a devastating, uh, but the best way to remember Sudan is by creating awareness through showcasing more stories on efforts and initiatives to save and protect the rhino. What is it that's inspired people like this to care so much. Why is this death significant? Thank you, Maliki, for having me talk about this very important issue that we care about dearly. It's no doubt that the death of Sudan is a stark and rude awakening to all of us as a global community that our wildlife is in a crisis. And part of the reason why we see this kind of innovation where people are campaigning to fundraise, one, to protect Sudan and all those imperiled species is because this is a real calamity. We are losing Africa's wildlife heritage, and this is happening fast and every day. So in as much as it is so sad to, lead, to lose the most eligible bachelor in Sudan, I hope this comes as a rude awakening to all of us to say we need to do something because we cannot, as a global community, afford to see this iconic species disappear under our watch. Mm. I got this uh, uh, comment here from Jackie on Twitter. She says, I'm totally gutted, but I can't imagine the loss felt by his daily 24-7 carers. As you can see, my profile picture is in his memory. You can see a little picture of him there. Wondering if the Conservancy will be able to breed another northern white rhino. So we know that there is an in vitro process. Explain to us the difficulty in, in, in making sure that this subspecies lives on. So again, you know, wildlife are wild, so they do best and are adapted to breed and to live and survive healthily in a wild environment. The process of in vitro fertilization is artificial. We are aware that even for human beings where there's been more research, it comes with cost with a lot of risks. So in the case of the northern white rhino and try and breed to get them back to viable populations, it's going to take a lot of effort. It's extremely expensive. I think the numbers have been thrown out there in the media. Researchers and scientists are doing the best possible. But at the end of the day, I think that again should be just remind us to say, 
why should we wait until this stage where we need to invest billions of money to just get a population that in the past, not so long back, was healthy in the world, but because of our own selfish greedy, we have ended up in this situation like in the case of the Northern White Rhino. Well said. Jamil, I'm going to pause you for a moment there to uh, shift the conversation just a bit to a practice that some animal rights activists would say is among the reasons that rhino, elephant, and big cat species are endangered in the first place, and that's trophy hunting. Animal rights and conservation groups in the United States recently filed a lawsuit against U.S. Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, also head of the country's Fish and Wildlife Service, over a decision to repeal an Obama-era ban on the import of animal trophies, which the department will now review on a case-by-case -case basis. Here's Tanya Sinereb, a lawyer for the Center for Biological Diversity. As the rest of the world is shutting down markets for elephants and their parts, the Trump administration has green-lighted wealthy U.S. trophy hunters to kill these majestic animals and bring them back to hang on the wall. Our lawsuit over U.S. trophy imports aims to ensure the administration hears from not just trophy hunters, but also scientists and the public at large and informs us of their decisions. Elephants and lions are on the road to extinction. We need to ensure these animals survive and thrive, not shoot them for fun. Conservationists say approximately 5,000 African elephants are killed every year. But proponents of trophy hunting argue that the money big game hunters pay to go on regulated trips helps fund conservation efforts. So what are the potential costs and consequences of the practice? Well, joining us to discuss, Charlie Mayhew is the chief executive and co-founder of the Tusk Trust. That's a UK-based conservation charity whose patron is Prince William. And in Dallas, Texas, Corey Mason is a wildlife biologist and the executive director of the Dallas Safari Club. That's a hunter's advocacy group. Welcome to the stream, gentlemen. I want to start with you, Corey, just to make sure that our audience is all on the same page. How would you describe trophy hunting? What is it? Yeah, there's a, there's a gross mischaracterization of what trophy hunting is and what it is not. Um, I would characterize hunting in the essence of a well-regulated science-based program that is sustainable. And the sustainability is, is of critical importance, obviously, oftentimes targeting a specific age class of, of, uh, of animals, and most specifically, oftentimes males. Uh, it should never be confused with poaching, which is an illegal practice, which is oftentimes the case with which we much know uh, the dem demise of a rhino, but that... That clear distinction needs to take place to have a, uh, a, a conversation uh, that has some merit based to it. Mm. So I pulled up this tweet on my screen here, Charlie. H.G. Flores says, unregulated trophy hunting decimates animal populations. However, well-regulated trophy hunting can mitigate the damages resulting from the current black market for prized animals. The profits can be redirected into conservation communities who will ensure that regulations are then enforced. What's your view on trophy hunting funding conservation efforts? Well, the, the, the problem that you have right from the word go is um, uh, when you talk about whether trophy hunting is regulated or not. Um, and unfortunately, uh, across Africa, uh, we have a problem whereby uh, there is endemic uh, corruption often within the systems that are designed to supposedly regulate hunting. And so uh, when uh, the trophy, trophy hunting fraternity talk about uh, regulating their hunting and uh, the funds going back into conservation, uh, they are often overstating, you know, that issues and, and, and those figures. So um, we are concerned uh, really uh, at Tosk about uh, the fact that the quota systems that are often um, put in place by the wildlife departments uh, to supposedly regulate hunting uh, are often abused, um, that the funds that uh, are being paid are going to central government um, or to the, to the trophy hunter, uh, the, sorry, the, the professional hunter. And um, the, the uh, percentage of the funds that actually get down to the ground and the support conservation are, again, often um, over-exaggerated. So, you know, there are some fundamental issues about whether 
the hunting is, is properly uh, regulated. Mm. Corey, what's your response to that? And we had a lot of people online saying that unfortunately there's corruption uh, when it comes to this, and so the money never actually makes it to where it needs to go. You know, we hear this uh, sort of generalized uh, assumption made on corruption uh, to the point where it's it's sort of just hyperbole. And, you know, it's easy to point to cases in which uh, hunting contributes very significantly to wildlife conservation, the preservation and conservation of vast lands that simply would not exist without the conservation through hunting model. We also have some very specific instances that we can point to, such as the campfire model in Zimbabwe, that gives control of wildlife resources as well as local benefits derived to local people in excess of $20 million annually uh, derived from hunting as well. So there are many instances, uh, as well as there may be some particular instances in some governments across the world, clearly, of which corruption occurs. That's not symptomatic of hunting. That's just people. Uh, so those generalization statements like that just don't hold much credence until we can have some specific case-by-case -case examples. Mm. I pulled up this tweet here, Jamil. Charlie says, animals hunted during trophy hunts are specifically selected based on their age, their health, their ability to breed. Trophy hunting gives much-needed funds to drive conservation efforts. There's that idea again. We're not saying it's not sad. It's just all day. That's what we have for now. What do local communities think of trophy hunters? So I think even just the discussion from my colleagues on panel here, um, the application of trophy hunting, one, as a sport, and two, as a revenue generation to plow back into conservation, ideally could work. What I think we should not lose sight of is the fact that right now, the majority of the species that are attractive for those that are in the sport of hunting are under threat. And we are working, I think, now with the countries that are the sources for these species to put in place measures for law enforcement and even for scientific monitoring that can allow for the checks and balances and accountability required to do hunting properly. And that doesn't exist in many places, if not all of them right now. So in the interest of the global good and in the interest of even sustaining that industry, it is important at this juncture to simply put aside promoting that sport. Now, what do communities think? Communities are poor, they need their livelihood to be improved, and they leave juxtaposition to wildlife species. There is conflict. So if there's any way we can work as a community to ensure that communities realize benefits to improve their quality of life from wildlife, we should do that. Ecotourism is one. Is hunting the final one? I think as far as we are concerned, as far as I'm concerned, as a Zimbabwean, yes, the campfire program worked well. Is it perfect? It has got loopholes. Zimbabweans would want it to work well because it is important for wildlife to contribute to the improvement of life in perpetuity, but it cannot as long as these checks and balances are not in place. Mm -hmm. And what we should be doing as a global community is to mobilize resources to build the capacity of the wildlife ecologists in these countries, of the local communities that are all very passionate about their wildlife, to make sure that it can be sustainable. And Jamil, as you're talking, I can see Charlie nodding his head there. Charlie? Yeah, no, I just, I just think that, um, you know, Campfire, uh, you know, worked pretty successfully when it uh, first started, but has subsequently been, uh, you know, hijacked by central government. Um, and I think it's very important that we get into perspective the income levels that uh, and the revenue that is generated uh, by hunting versus, um, you know, traditional photographic safari tourism. Safari tourism in Africa, you know, generates something like $17 billion a year, whereas the hunting uh, industry contributes probably about $132 million. So it's, it's less than 0.7, it's by 0.78% of safari tourism revenue. Um, so, uh, and if you look at a country like Kenya where they've, uh, they've stopped hunting uh, uh, many years ago, um, the communities that live alongside wildlife um, have uh, successfully created a number of, of community-driven conservancies which are now generating significant revenue for those communities from photographic tourism. So, you know, I think the thing is that, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, if the, if the hunting fraternity uh, is able to get their house fully in order, properly regulated, uh, and demonstrate that the money really genuinely gets down to the ground, 
um, then potentially there's a place for it, um, you know, in Africa. Because um, one of the big uh, concerns that we have, of course, coming down the track over and above the illegal wildlife trade is actually loss of habitat. Mm. Uh, the human population in Africa is set to double by 2050. And that's putting uh, wildlife under huge pressure, um, you know, from a potential loss of habitat. So, you know, in, in that sense, potentially uh, the hunting concessions that currently exist in, in a number of these countries do still have a role to play in saving that habitat. Right. But as I emphasize, it's really about making sure that they're not abusing the quota system and that they are, it, it is, you know, it is properly regulated. Mm. At, at the moment, I'd suggest that it's not. Right. And, and uh, Corey, I want to give you the last word there, but I want to bring up this tweet from Elizabeth. She says, in addition, just viewing wildlife brings in far more revenue than killing these great animals. The idea that hunting benefits Africa is a myth perpetrated by men who want heads mounted on their walls. Corey. Yeah, so I want to go back to something that both of the gentlemen prior to me have mentioned that we can all absolutely empirically agree on, and that is worldwide the single greatest threat to wildlife species is the loss of habitat. Uh, that, is, that is something we should all agree on. Uh, now, a couple of things uh, to, to just really offers counterpoint. Uh, as far as amount of revenue generated from photo tourism to, to hunting, uh, I have very different statistics uh, as well. You know, hunting generates in excess north of $300 million on an annual basis. Uh, again, and with where that takes place regarding phototourism, understanding the requirements of each, they should rather complement each other rather than compete. Phototourism, phototourism takes place in national parks and areas that are well-developed with really high concentrations of game species, easy access, uh, lots of infrastructure, whereas hunting typically takes place in areas that are far more remote, not easy to access, less disc game population. So I would offer that the two can complement each other rather than compete mm. with each other. That is the last word. I'm going to pause the discussion for now. Thanks again to Charlie Mayhew and Corey Mason for helping us break down this issue. Jamil, hold tight, though, as we're going to examine an idea that might be just as controversial as trophy hunting, allowing some endangered species to go extinct. Well, it is a strategy that some conservationists propose as an alternative to the notion that endangered species must be preserved at any cost. So, to paraphrase the English author George Orwell, are all endangered species worthy of being saved or are some species more worthy than others? Well, on Skype from London, joining us is Hugh Possingham, the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, the world's largest environmental NGO. Welcome to the stream, Hugh. I pulled up on my laptop here a couple of headlines we've been seeing floating around this from the New York Times magazine. Scroll down, press this beautiful illustration to the headline, Should Some Species Be Allowed to Die Out? This isn't the only one. There's also this one from Outside.com. It's time to let certain animals go extinct. Hugh, talk to us about this idea. It's not popular, but is it the right idea? Well, we're, we're already doing it, Malika. Um, species are going extinct currently at a thousand times the background rate. So we are causing massive extinctions of species. The uh, northern white rhino is just the tip of the iceberg. It's the tip of the tip of the iceberg. They're disappearing all the time. Australia alone lost two, two mammal species just in the last 10 years and nobody particularly noticed. So our approach isn't about letting species go extinct. Our approach is using our money much better to actually minimise the number of extinctions by making much clearer choices about what we choose to keep. Uh, but in fact, that will slow the extinction rate down if we rationally invest, just as if you rationally invest in the stock market, you will make more money. Mm. And you mentioned using our money much better. Jamil, uh, that is because we had a lot of people online saying things like the amount that it costs just to protect Sudan, who we mentioned earlier, that last male white rhino, uh, could have been used for other things. Well, so, so this is because the situation with Sudan and with most of the species now is a crisis. So the big question we should ask ourselves in line with that is what got us to this situation? I mean, we need to have the proper stewardship over the resources that we are custodians over. We need to ensure the land uses, the population growth, the urbanization, the extent to which we encroach on the habitats the extent to which we maintain healthy ecosystems that can function on their own without necessarily requiring for us to eventually try to artificialize 
and you have to invest around the clock 24-7 security, which is what we are faced with now. So the best way is let's put our money into pro-conservation livelihoods for communities that have always lived with wildlife. Remember, in Africa, which is the main source country, you know, people have always been hunting and gatherers. There are totems, there are cultures that are inherently associated with wildlife, so they need and value wildlife. But now we're at a point where wildlife is being lost, not even by the local communities largely, but by syndicates that are outside for selfish reasons. So we need to get back to the basics. Let's put our money into the best agricultural production systems to intensify, mm -hmm. produce more on a small space, and in that way allow for connectivity and ecosystem function. And I can see Hugh nodding uh, his head there. Hugh, I want to read this before I, I throw it to you. Janaki on Twitter says, this interest in Sudan, the rhino, is testament to his place in people's hearts. We are an inherently biased species, holding up one species over another. So I've stopped questioning why the press covers Sudan, but not that last anonymous Vietnamese Javan rhino killed by by a poacher in 2010 that had no benefit of a fundraising campaign or the degree of protection that Sudan enjoyed. We are who we are. She seems resigned to it there, but why is it that we have focused on uh, Sudan, the rhino, versus the rhino she mentioned? Well, I hope the focus on Sudan will bring attention to the thousands of other species that are in this terrible situation, like the other three species of rhinoceros in Asia that are all in a perilous state. I mean, Jamal makes incredibly good points. The bottom line is, if humanity wants to take extinctions down to normal levels, to backgrounds rates, we will have to invest 10 times the money we now invest in conservation. Mm. We shouldn't have to do triage. Triage is only necessary, prioritisation is only necessary because our investments in conservation are, are tiny, tiny compared to our investments in other important things. And one wonders, in two or three hundred years time when half the species on the planet have gone uh, we'll be rethinking about investments in um, defense i mean the defense industry is a hundred times bigger than the conservation industry if not a thousand times bigger why did we spend all that money on things that don't benefit future generations mm -hmm. hugh i pulled up here from the wwf a species directory and everyone can see this it, the, the the url is there worldwildlife.org and you do a scroll through and you see that there are several critically endangered uh, species and then at the bottom it gets endangered and then it turns into vulnerable but uh, there is a, a lot of species on here and maybe not a lot of attention given to them. What other species should we be looking out for in your view, Hugh? Well, that list represents about, there, there are um, around about 5,500 listed vertebrates that are endangered in some kind. That, let, that ignores, of course, all the plants and the insects. Mm -hmm. um, so I would urge people that anywhere in your neighbourhood there is a species that's probably going to go extinct sometime in the next 10 or 20 years and it's all our responsibilities to work on them. Some of them can be saved for $50,000, not $100 million. Mm. There are species within 10 kilometres of your house that need your help here and now. They may be a plant, they may be an insect, they may be a small brown bird, but they're all part of biodiversity uh, and they all need our help. Uh, Jamil, in about 30 seconds, if there is an animal you think we're not paying enough attention to, what would it be? Well, I mean, think of the group of tortoises, you know, these are taken for granted. Think of the, the giraffes even, you know, think of a, a lot of other birds, species. I mean, it's all about the balance of nature. So we are actually losing a lot of trophic relations in our ecosystems. And when we focus on the iconic ones, of course, in that process, we also they are kind of umbrella species that cover the other subspecies that are also endangered. Mm -hmm. Well, you heard it there. That's Jamal Mandima. We also heard from Charlie Mayhew, Corey Mason, and in this segment, Hugh Possingham. Thank you so much. I'll give the last word to Benjamin on Twitter, who says, we desperately need to train a new generation in wildlife conservation. Sudan's death must not be in vain. We must save all endangered species. This is our duty as custodians of the earth. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. And of course, you can continue to follow the discussion about endangered wildlife online with hashtag AJ Stream. See you next time.